Good afternoon to those of you in Singapore. Good morning to those of you in the UK. Uh, a warm welcome to today's BritCham Presents webinar, looking at the IP enforcement manual for Singapore. My name is David Kelly, and I'm the executive director here at the British Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. I'd like to thank our event partners today, Rouse Consultancy, for joining us as we deep dive into the latest edition of the IP enforcement manual for Singapore. The manual can assist businesses that are already operating in Singapore um, or those that are planning to grow here. And it delves into the specifics of Singapore's laws and regulations, as well as the methods for enforcing intellectual property rights. Something that we do get asked as a Chamber of Commerce from a number of businesses that are looking to expand into Singapore and the region. It also includes commentary on context and practice that explains what works and what doesn't in Singapore and gives a better understanding of the country's enforcement landscape. This is set to be another interactive session, so if you would like to ask a question to our speakers, um, please use the dedicated Q&A box on your Zoom toolbar. I will now hand over to Desmond Tan, Southeast Asia IP advisor and IPO attache at the British High Commission in Singapore, for his opening remarks, and I will allow him to introduce our wonderful speakers today. Desmond, a warm welcome to you. Great to see you, and over to you. Right. So thank you, David. So good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends from the UK, Singapore, and also around the world. So I'm Desmond Tan. I'm from the UK IP office and also the foreign office, and I head up UK's IP policies in Southeast Asia. Um, it's good to see all of you here today, and I trust that you're keeping well and safe. So as we are here today to launch our Singapore IP Enforcement Business Guide, our hearts and prayers are also with the people of Ukraine as they face this terrible moment in their nation's history. So we pray that a peaceful and diplomatic solution based on international law and also UN Charter can be found swiftly. And as our foreign, minister, our foreign secretary has mentioned to, you, to Ukraine, the UK is with you for this. So yeah. uh, now back to this is that so IPO, we have a global network of IP attaches across the various markets. And our aim is to work with ASEAN governments to co-develop an IP environment that is conducive for business, innovation, and also creativity. And we do this through policy and also ground initiatives. For us, the IPO will continue to develop a suite of IP tools and business and services to help businesses quickly understand and navigate the IP landscape in ASEAN. And in particular, how do you protect and enforce your IP assets? So today, we are pleased to launch the Singapore IP Enforcement Manual together with our partners, the Singapore Ministry of Law, the IP Office of Singapore, and also Bridge Sham Singapore. You'll be pleased to know that actually Singapore has one of the best IP regimes in the region, and IP protection and enforcement procedures are generally efficient and effective. So it is my pleasure to have with us today expert speakers from Ministry of Law, Ms. Lili So, who is the Deputy Director of the Intellectual Property Policy Division, and also from Browse IP, which is Ms. Anushka, consultant, who will then cover more details of this business guide later on. So this guide is available on BridgeShams website and also IPO's International IP Service website. So you just need to Google IPO International IP Service Gov UK and you can find this website. So we have, besides Singapore, we have also developed a number of enforcement guides for the, the other ASEAN markets and we will publish them online subsequently like Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, Cambodia, so feel free to check in on the IPO page regularly for updates. And for now, I will hand over to Ms. Anushka, who will share more. So Anushka, over to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Desmond. And then can you please put on the slide, please? Thanks again, Desmond. Uh, good morning uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this session today. I am Anushka Arya, and I am based in Singapore, and I work at a global IP firm now. I work on intellectual property matters, including IP enforcement in Southeast Asia. We have drafted this uh, IP enforcement manual for the UK IP office uh, and published through the British Chamber in Singapore. These IP enforcement procedures in the manual are up to date as of March 21, but there have been some amendments to the copyright law since then, which will be covered by our next speaker, uh, Lily. Users of this manual should also take, we also advise them to take local advice uh, to ensure uh, accuracy. Intellectual property or IP, which consists of uh, brands, copyrights, patents, designs, and other forms of IP, is, is, is of growing importance for global businesses. 
investors need to deploy their IT assets in countries they invest in. And for this, they need clear and consistent rules to protect them. The very same IP rules also help local companies create higher value knowledge-based businesses. It's no coincidence that countries with a weak IP system often have weak IP creation and weak export industry as well. Singapore, however, as Desmond noted, has a robust IP protection and enforcement regime, and I will cover that in my presentation today. Next slide, please. Hello? Next, please. Next one on robust IP enforcement regime. That's correct. Thank you. So as I was saying, Singapore has a strong legal system with robust remedies for IP infringement. Singapore is ranked second in the world and first in Asia in the World Economic Forum Global Competitive Report 2019. And it also ranked third in the International Property Rights Index 2020. Singapore has a very efficient enforcement process. Uh, the enforcement regime complies with TRIPS and has gained a reputation of being, which in Singapore has a reputation of being Asia's IP hub as well. The trademark process is very efficient. Uh, there's this very straightforward streamlined trademark application process without deficiency. If, if there are no de and if there are no deficiency or objections, you know one may expect to receive the certificate within six months, which is fairly uh, quick. In fact, approximately fifty thousand trademark classes were filed in Singapore in the year 2020, uh, and it shows how how robust the system is. There was also the iPort. Uh, uh, Go app, which was launched, uh, which is the first app, uh, you know, in the world for, for filing trademark applications, and it makes, uh, enables trademark owners to register IP from a mobile app. So we will be talking more about how robust the system is and how, how civil and criminal and IP, IP enforcement work in Singapore. And in this manual, particularly, we are focusing on uh, counterfeiting, which is trademark infringement and privacy, which is copyright infringement goods. So that is what we are focusing on as part of this IP enforcement manual. The manual also provides summary in terms of the practicalities. It has commentary sections, which talks about uh, the practical applications of the legal provisions in the Singapore copyright and trademark law. Next slide, please, Helen. Thank you. So this manual covers three main areas of IP enforcement as they apply to counterfeit and pirated goods. So we cover three main areas, which is criminal, civil, and border enforcement. We'll also cover administrative and e-commerce IP enforcement. So starting with criminal actions, which criminal actions mainly cover conducting raids to see suspected counterfeit and pirated goods, followed by criminal prosecutions in the criminal courts. Singapore, to be honest, does not have an extensive criminal privacy or counterfeit issue, but the criminal, uh, the criminal process or the criminal actions are, are holistic on its own. Trademark counterfeiting and copyright privacy is, is found through the police, or there's also a complaint mechanism. Uh, there's also um, a collaboration where the rights owners can collaborate with the police and file complaints. We talk about that later. Then there are civil actions which means bringing court cases against the counterfeiter or, or the copyright infringer uh, to get an order or an order of injunction to stop the infringement or piracy and claim damages. Singapore has a very sophisticated civil system. We talk about that in the next slide where we talk about how there are specialized IT courts in Singapore and how the process is, is, is moving towards getting more streamlined and more cost effective by the day. Administrative actions, there are actually no administrative actions available under the trademark and the copyright law. So there, is, uh, there are no administrative remedies, enforcement remedies under the trademark and the copyright law itself. However, there is there are customs border enforcement actions, which where the customs authorities mainly intercept IP infringing goods at the border. The Trademark Act and the Copyright Act stipulate border enforcement measures to in that intend to restrict importing and exporting of privacy and counterfeit goods. Moving on to e-commerce IP enforcement. E-commerce IP enforcement mainly refers to removing pirated content or counterfeit goods from e-commerce platforms or ISPs, 
uh, which are internet, internet service providers or internet access providers. There are no specific provisions in the trademark and copyright law. However, what the provisions with regard to counterfeiting and privacy in the laws apply to online counterfeiting and privacy as well. E-commerce IP enforcement is, is mainly done through uh, notices and takedowns. The notice and takedown regime, which is quite effective because the ISPs and the platforms have contractual terms of service and the system works pretty effectively in the Next slide, please. So now we discuss about trademark and copyright protection. We talk, we talk about uh, how there's a dual system, what, what kind of a dual system is there for trademark. So a registered proprietor has exclusive rights to use trademarks in relation to goods and services for which the trademark is registered. In the Singapore Trademark Act, there's a dual system of protection for registered and well-known marks under which are they are, that are protected under the Trademark Act and the unregistered marks that can be enforced, objected also, but can be enforced uh, under the law of passing law. So it is advised trademark owners to register their marks because there are benefits to it, which is that it provides evidence of validity and ownership of registration. It also helps shift the burden on the, on the accused, you know, who is, who is disapproving of the infringement. Passing off actions uh, for, for unregistered marks uh, requires the owner to prove goodwill and distinctiveness of its trademark. With regard to copyright, uh, under the Copyright Act, the owner, copyright owner, has an exclusive right or has a has an exclusive right also to authorize someone someone else to, to make a copy, make reproductions uh, of, of, of their work, uh, publish the work. Uh, communicate the work to the public, uh, perform the work in the public, make adaptations, etc. Infringement of copyright will occur where a person does any of the above acts without the copyright owner's consent. Copyright, uh, copyright however, is, is, is conferred automatic protection, so there's no need to register copyright. However, it is suggested that whenever in legal proceedings, right owner will, will need to present evidence of copyright substance and ownership. So when it comes to enforcement, it's, it's advised to get, get copyright registered. Therefore, the rights owners, like I said, may, may consider registering copyrights in, in jurisdictions which permit copyright registration as that will be helpful in bringing enforcement actions. Next slide, please, Helen. Criminal IP enforcement. So we will start with criminal IP enforcement now. Uh, so in line with the TRIPS agreement that, that Singapore is signatory to, uh, Singapore has enacted strict laws to deal with the issue of counterfeit and pirated products and impose onerous penalties on the infringers. Singapore has a two-pronged approach for criminal IP enforcement. One is a police led approach and the other is a more collaborative private prosecution approach <clears throat> that the right holders can do. Starting with the police led approach, it's basically when upon getting any information of infringement, uh, the police will make an assessment. They will, they will do raids and they will investigate to gather evidence before, before initiating any criminal proceeding in court. On the other hand, a collaborative approach where the rights holders collaborate with the police uh, to, to gather intelligence and, you know, before uh, initiating any raids uh, before the, uh, with the police, they, they gather more intelligence and they gather more data to surveys, etc. And then they uh, join hands with the police to conduct raids. This private prosecution is actually, uh, it's, is actually an falls under uh, the TRIPS obligation, uh, it comes under, under the TRIPS uh, provisions, uh, demonstrating how, and it demonstrates how Singapore places on the rights, you know, uh, how much importance Singapore places on the rights of IP owners, where they allow, um, they, they've also allowed the private prosecutions by the rights holders. Private investigators and IP law firms assist uh, IP owners with the criminal cases. So, so a party can, uh, because, Gently, uh, court proceedings are complex and discuss complex uh, uh, 
complexities of of the uh, trademark and copyright laws it's advised that you know criminal uh, enforcement private investigators are hired and they are lawyers who can assist ip owners with the cases just quickly running through the criminal enforcement process for trademark infringement uh, so under the trademark act the district court or the magistrate have have jurisdiction to hear and determine uh, any 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 criminal cases under trademark act uh as as i said that uh right right owners they begin investigations like field investigations or market surveys to identify the sources or the supply of counterfeit goods and a certain the extent of counterfeits thereafter they can make traffic cases uh to, to gather more evidence for the court and after the right owner is convinced the traffic cases are indeed counterfeit complaints can be lodged to the court uh for issuance of search warrants you know authorizing the police to to raid the premises or or condemn and and seize any infringing goods after seizure infringer may contact the right holder to settle the matter if the right holder agrees the matter can be resolved if not then uh, appropriate action in the court will be instituted criminal remedies uh, uh, under criminal enforcement system are typically in the form of fines imprisonment for future seizures destruction of goods or articles etc Now moving on to the criminal process for for copyright infringement, uh, the district court or the magistrate court have jurisdiction to try any offence under the Copyright Act. Uh, criminal prosecution uh, is for copyright is 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 the the scope is limited where it's restricted to cases that that have you know there are where public interest justifies imposition of of any criminal sanction. There are also local enforcement agencies uh, like the IPRB that conduct. uh you know that that work they are under the police and they work on on copyright infringement and infringement cases data shows that between 2009 and 2019 iprb conducted more than 2000 copyright related raids solely in singapore and and they they seized about 52 million singapore dollars of, of they made seizures of that amount and that huge amount uh, did the raids also include the trademarks as well um but this shows how effective the iprb is 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 in uh, enforcing uh, copyright on the ground criminal remedies again like, like trademarks are in the form of fines imprisonment orders seizures of articles etc next slide please hali moving on to civil ip enforcement um We'll start with the relevant courts for trademarks and copyrights, and which are the relevant courts where a suit can be instituted. So, for the trademark case, it uh, is heard by the general division of the first level of the High Court, and an appeal can be made to the Appeal Division. The format of a trademark trademark infringement proceeding is, is similar to to other civil litigation process. In the case of copyright cases, uh, the copyright tribunal has the jurisdiction to resolve the copyright disputes, and they can issue binding orders on parties. Where the dispute relates to a question of law, the tribunal can refer the matter to the High Court as well. As I was saying initially, that the civil civil system in Singapore is very sophisticated. So one example is that the IP cases in High Courts are typically heard by specialist IP judges who are. Experts and who have relevant expertise in 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 the uh, in IT matters. There's also an IP court guide which is customized for IT disputes and which encapsulates the IP court's case management features and any specialist practices. In terms of legislation, uh, the IP dispute resolution bill was passed in 2019, uh, and one of the proposals and it does not come into effect yet but one of the proposals under that was to consolidate most civil disputes in the high court and which also includes the current dis- disputes that are ongoing in the state courts as well maybe lily can take up in the next uh, uh, session and you know maybe we, we can ask her uh, a few questions around this in terms of how how the dis- what the status of, of this is and uh, you know uh, In, there was also uh, under this uh, draft resolution bill there was also a proposal for fast track courts for IT disputes that featured simplified uh, processes and and cost saving features that will allow rights holders and litigants to resolve disputes in a more cost effective uh, efficient manner so maybe we can cover that in the next uh, session or in the queue in the session just just to see where this is and how how you know what's the progress on this then uh 
the civil court, the civil procedure process is, is akin, as we said, to the civil litigation process. So there's, there's a writ or a statement of claim filed initially uh, before the court. Uh, the Singapore legal system provides for discovery uh, where parties produce and exchange documents and, and, and rely upon its evidence. There are also interrogatories. Interrogatories are also like um, a discovery tool that, that parties can use uh, to have specific questions about the case answered. So in, in, in the interrogatories, uh, there are like listed questions sent to the other party that they need to respond back in writing. For civil uh, proceeding, in a civil proceeding, the burden of proof for infringement is on the claimant. Uh, evidence uh, usually uh, is provided by way of affidavits two weeks before the commencement of the trial. At the trial, after the party's opening statements are made, uh, the witnesses, uh, both both witnesses, factual and expert witnesses that are there, are subject to cross examination by the opposite counsel. Um, and after all evidence has been led, the court usually requests for written closing submissions to be filed. And as you mentioned about expert uh, witnesses, uh, parties may also appoint their own expert witnesses. In fact, courts also appoint their own independent technical experts to help them in, in determining the, the, the issue at hand. Next, next slide, please, uh, Helen. Oh, just, just before moving, I would just like to say that in case of all pre registration and pre grant uh, proceedings, they are heard by the IPOS and they they also they may adjudicate revocation and invalidation disputes to great marks. Right. Now we talk about uh, civil IP enforcement and the remedies that are available to the rights holders uh, against uh, IP infringement, trademark and copyright infringement. <clears throat> so remedies, if you talk about a measure of relief that, that you know courts can grant to the rights holders uh, for, for the rights that are in for their rights that are infringed in, in civil lawsuits. Remedies for trademarks can include uh, injunctions, uh, damages, accounts of profits, uh, and also like ordering for removing the offending sign or the offending logo or in order for disposal of infringing goods. In, in, with regard to trademarks, uh, a trademark owner who successfully sues a counterfeiter for trademark is entitled to an injunction, which could both be interlocutory, interim, and a final injunction, which is decided on the merits of the case. They're, they're, they, they can be awarded damages uh, if, if the court considers uh, appropriate. Uh, the court may award damages as well, or accounts of profit. Uh, and damages are basically awarded on a compensatory basis. To be, the, the whole idea is to put the Claimant or, or the aggrieved party in the position as, as it was before if the infringement hadn't happened. Remedies for copyright infringement are mostly similar. And in terms of damages as well, the courts usually consider you know, what the extent of the infringement is, uh, what the loss is that the claimant has faced uh, or, or has, is likely to suffer. Uh, if there are any benefits that have been that have been shown to be accrued to the defendant, if they've had any profits out of this infringement activity, then then that can be issued in the form of damages as well, and uh, the need to deter other similar instances. Infringement. So the courts consider many factors when they are awarding damages in a particular case. <clears throat> Legal costs, in fact, are also recoverable as damages, uh, and. Civil, as I said, it's, it's a very sophisticated system in, in Singapore. It's it's fairly sophisticated, and and you know the, the the court system and the subsequent enforcement procedure is fairly swift and efficient as well. Especially now with the uh, fast track courts coming, sixty percent of of in fact uh, you know uh, legal costs can be recovered uh, in, in civil litigation. So that's basically a lot of the amount getting a, a getting compensated. So this is why there's a reason why uh, this is the reason why uh, rights holders are looking at uh, civil civil uh, enforcement measures now. Um, also, because there aren't uh, there's not much of criminal uh, uh, counterfeiting and privacy in Singapore, but just because of its sophisticated nature, it it, it moves rights yeah. holders to, to take the part for civil enforcement in, in Singapore. There are also other uh, alternative dispute resolution measures like arbitration and mediation. Uh, IP rights are now arbitrable uh, uh, and they're capable of set settlement by arbitration in between the parties. 
Uh, there also there's the Y cooperate this arbitration and mediation center in in Singapore uh, with respect to trademark disputes, and there's uh, also SIAC, uh, all they're providing facilities for arbitration, uh, and they have a specialized IP panel for arbitrators to hear IP disputes solely. Next slide, please, Helen. In the interest of time, I'll just quickly run through. The next one is the another important mechanism that can be uh, uh, used, which is using warning letters and negotiations. So this is an amicable way of setting up, setting the case to negotiation. Uh, the compliance rates are very high. Uh, it's very cost effective and you get quicker results as well. Uh, the objective is to request or demand the infringers to stop infringing. And the idea is also to educate them uh, and warn them uh, of, of any legal risk that might happen if they don't comply. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Customs IP protection system. So, uh, so the border enforcement provisions provide measures for detection and enforcement of goods infringing, uh, infringing and copyright, and, and you know moving in and out of Singapore. The Trademark Act and the Copyright Act stipulate border enforcement measures uh, for restricting import and export of files within counterfeit goods. There is actually no official IP recording system in Singapore. However, the border enforcement can be activated by a written notice to the customer, which is, called, which is under the lodge and notices uh, mm -hmm. about suspected importation uh, of IPR infringing goods. This process, there's an, so this is the process to notice. There's another process, um, which is, um, you know, which is an ex officio uh, me method that the customs can, can use. So customs may also act as ex, ex officio and detain goods imported in and exported from Singapore. Um, however, the IP owner, uh, in term, in, for, for the, for the notice part, for the, for the notice where, where the IP owner needs to file a notice. The IP owner must file a written notice to customs to inform them of each suspected shipping. Singapore does not have, it does not provide for border enforcement for goods in transit, right? While it is still possible for trademarks and copyright owners to request seizure of infringing goods being imported and exported, but they cannot do for infringing goods in transit. However, under the ex-official power, Singapore may have powers to stop infringing goods in transit as well. The, the police intellectual property rights branch enforces inland retail level piracy while the Singapore Customs, together with Immigration and Checkpoints Authority, uh, you know, whose, whose officers are, are vested with powers of customs, uh, is responsible for border enforcement. There is also collaboration between uh, Singapore Customs and intellectual property rights holders where training sessions are done on a regular basis. Uh, to share information with customers on counterfeit products and how to in, how to differentiate them from from genuine ones. Next slide, please, Anna. Thank you. And lastly, e-commerce IP protection. Uh, as as I said, there are no specific provisions uh, uh, on e-commerce IP enforcement under the copyright and the trademark laws. However, uh, you know, same principles uh, that are there that apply for for counterfeit goods or pirated goods in general, apply to online counterfeiting as well. Uh, to date, there have been no reported cases, however, on, on trademark infringement uh, against ISPs or against uh, marketplaces, but uh, <clears throat> uh, online IP enforcement is relatively strong as compared to other countries in the region. Much stronger in Singapore, definitely. Uh, this is mainly because of the uh, of the strong notice and takedown system mechanisms uh, that the brand owners can avail themselves to. In fact, uh, in practice, uh, you know, major online marketplaces operating in Singapore have faced measures against IP infringement. Uh, so platforms have their own me mechanisms and measures as well to deal with uh, online IP infringement. Uh, and there are also case laws that, that, that validate online platforms can no longer uh, refute uh, or deny liability merely because they did not physically manufacture or stock the products, and courts will investigate an ISP property business model to determine their secondary liability and their fee. So, so the e-commerce IP protection regime is, is definitely uh, robust. However, the issues arise because they are, they are the, the the regime is not as strong in, in other countries in the region from where products are coming in and going out. So. Um, the problem, uh, the, the problem that Singapore faces is 
because of ownership, uh, infringement issues outside of Singapore, more outside and more in the region. However, the system within Singapore, as, as I discussed, is um, fairly robust and comprehensive. Thank you. Uh, over to you, uh, Lily. Sorry, I think, uh, I hope I'm not taking a lot of time uh, discussing this, but over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so if you could move on to my slides, that would be great. Um, I really would like to thank um, Anushka for, uh, and, and Rouse actually for creating such a comprehensive IP enforcement manual for Singapore. I, I mean, I learned some things reading it as well. Um, uh, I mean, un, uh, the information in the, the manual is of a certain date uh, from uh, early last year. So uh, when I looked at it, I thought it might be best for uh, Ministry of Law to come in and just highlight some of the changes that have actually come into effect as of November 2021 um, with our new Copyright Act, um, because some of it actually does change um, what uh, was captured in the manual. And then I'll cover a little bit about, I think, um, enforcement in Singapore, like practicalities of it uh, at the end. Uh, next slide, please. So again, um, mostly key changes in our new Copyright Act 2021, and then a bit about enforcement and dispute resolution in Singapore. Uh, next slide, thank you. So the main changes that I'm going to highlight, I mean, we um, this, this Copyright Act is actually quite a major review. So we've had multiple uh, changes that are captured in the new Act, um, but specifically to what, uh, what is in the IP manual for enforcement. Um, uh, I wanted to highlight that we have new civil and criminal liabilities in relation to uh, the commercial distribution of devices and services, um, like your Kodi TV boxes that you have in the UK. Um, we also did a bit of rationalization of our criminal penalties. Uh, and we also have new exceptions, um, such as the ones that we have for computational data analysis. So next slide, thank you. So just a very short brief, um, the Copyright Act really is the culmination of the most extensive review we've done for our Copyright Act. Um, the old Copyright Act was from the 1980s. Um, so this new act uh, completely rewrites it, uh, repeals and reenacts the old act. Um, I'm here as a representative of the joint uh, group, which helped to review the act. So it's a joint effort between the Ministry of Law and our statutory board, the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore. You might know him as uh, IPOS. Um, you may have seen our public consultations. We did one in 2016, one in 2017, one in 2020, and then one early last year. And it really just is trying to update uh, our regime for the new digital age. Um, and um, really to ensure that copyright continues to reward the creation of works and, and innovation and creativity, and at the same time, making sure that works are still reasonably available for societal benefit. Um, so I put a little QR code there. Um, what I'll be covering is really just a fraction of the things that we've changed in the Copyright Act, the ones that are very relevant for enforcement. If you're interested in other things that we've changed in the Copyright Act, we've moved um, default ownership of commissioned works, we've introduced a new moral rights system, etc. cetera. Um, you can just take a look at that QR code that will bring you to IPOS's website, which has fact sheets on the changes. Hopefully we've written them simply enough so that you can understand it, okay. We will just move on to the actual bits that we want to cover now. Next slide, please. <laughs> now, the biggest one I think we've done uh, in terms of enforcement basis um, is we've created a new um, civil and criminal liability for people who were uh, selling or distributing or offering services that are kind of keen to the Cody box, Cody TV box situation that you have in the UK. So in, previously in Singapore, uh, the situation was more that uh, we had um, people who were selling TV boxes that would plug into TVs. Um, they're not necessarily Cody branded. Um, you could have one that was what we call fully loaded it was a box that came everything included. You just plug and play and you get to your pirated streaming um, content straight away. Um, we had what we, what internally we considered kind of grayish, whitish boxes. It may be that the box was brought in from overseas having been manufactured as a, a simple um, Android TV, Android box. 
like a clean box, like a Xiaomi box, for example. Um, but then the seller then uh, helps to load uh, unauthorized streaming apps as an extra service. Or uh, at the point of being sold, he tells you, oh, this is a clean box. But if you pay me the money, I will then give you um, instructions on how to load those apps yourself or give you a link to a place which would then give you the instructions. But the basic point is when you purchase the box, it was with the understanding that the box will have that kind of functionality in the future, even if the seller didn't himself do something to it. So I think these were the kind of edge cases we were trying to make sure we captured. And then I think we also considered that in the future, maybe people won't be selling physical boxes. Um, they may come to your house and offer to uh, install an app on your existing smart TV, for example, because we've already seen smart TVs being sold with these apps. So some of it was trying to make sure it's future proof. Now, what actually happened was um, retailers often sidestepped the legality of such products. Sometimes they were even brave enough to say, no, we are actually legitimate. Um, the right owners can't do anything to us. We're just selling. Um, and from the ministry of law and IPOS's point of view, though, we did not think that they were any different from people who were selling pirated DVDs. Just because the technology is that the box no longer had the copyright infringing product inside the box um, doesn't mean that they are less liable. But however, the, the law was a bit unclear as to their liability. So in the next slide, if you would go on to that, uh, I'll show you what we did. So effectively, what we've done is that anyone who knowingly engages in commercial dealings, so selling, offering for sale, distributing for trade, for example, making, um, if they do that for devices or services, and they know that such devices or services have the ability to let consumers um, access infringing streaming content, um, whether it is by a subscription service, you're just offering a subscription service, or you're selling them a fully loaded box, or you're selling them a clean box with the intention of loading afterwards, or you're getting them to load it. So long as you're getting money, and at the point of the transaction, the person knows what he's doing, and the consumer also knows that the box will have that kind of functionality, um, you will be both uh, civilly and <laughs> criminally liable. Uh, so that's what we've done in the new act. So next one. <laughs> We also um, already existing, having, uh, we have existing criminal provisions, um, uh, criminal offenses, sorry, um, which, which has slightly strange ways of uh, putting the penalties. So, the, so some of these offenses are a bit historical and some of them got added on later. So we did a rationalization um, um, exercise. Basically what we did was we took all the criminal offenses we had as well as the new one with the, um, the gray boxes and we put them in two buckets. So there's one bucket where these are offenses that have commercial elements, um, whether you're making for sale, you're distributing, you're importing, there's willful infringement for commercial advantage. So this will be in the commercial element bucket. And then for those, they all have the same um, penalty. So we've actually raised some of the ones in this bucket to the highest penalty we already have in the, for the offenses in that bucket, which would be 100,000 um, Singapore dollars uh, as a fine imprisonment of not exceeding five years um, for individuals. Uh, and if you are a corporate, because you can't imprison corporates, what we've done for a deterrent effect is to double the individual uh, penalties. So for corporates, if you fall, with, if your offense is within that commercial element bucket, um, your fine is uh, up to 200,000 Singapore dollars. Now with the, where you have offenses that don't have commercial elements, if example, you are distributing or importing to a large extent, but not for trade. Um, if you do willful or significant uh, uh, infringement, but it's not for commercial advantage, there's a separate bucket for the non-commercial ones. And then the fines are 20K, um, imprisonment up to two years. And then again, there is double that for corporates um, for 40K. So that's some of the rationalization we've done to make the criminal penalty system easier to understand and easier to implement. Okay, next. 
Um, we actually covered quite a lot of new, um, what we call permitted users in the new act, but basically there are exceptions or defenses. Um, but the one I thought we wanted to highlight the most um, to, to this audience, since uh, you might be able to actually utilize it, is the one we have for um, using works for computational data analysis. Uh, this, is the, this is the slide I usually use to ex explain to people who are not doing data analysis, but um, the basic concept is um, we are trying to make um, what would have been in an analog world, um, not copyright infringement because people are just doing it in their heads. But because now you use um, a computer to do the analysis, um, you have to make copies. So the copying that is incidental to you having to have access to that data and then analyzing it, to us, we didn't think that needed to be protected by copyright in so far that copyright owners somehow have an additional right to it. Um, we do think that this is in a way transformational um, and also it is a non-consumptive um, non use of the copyright work. Um, so next slide, please. So next slide. Okay. <laughs> so what we've created is a new um, exception um, where you basically, so long as you access the work um, in a lawful manner. So if, for example, if the, the copyrighted work or the, the, the basic data that you're getting, it has to be, you know, you have to have a subscription to access it. You have to pay that subscription. Um, if it was available on the internet for kind of free to access, that's fine. Um, but basically you shouldn't be breaking any locks to get to it. But once that is done, um, if you make copies of it in order to run computational data analysis on it, um, that act of copying is uh, okay under this exception. Um, even if, for example, um, if, if you have a subscription to uh, a, a journal database and maybe in the journal database uh, terms and conditions, they may have said something like, uh, you cannot copy for um, data analysis purposes. This exception would trump that. Uh, it, uh, it actually, um, uh, contractual overrides are not allowed under this exception. Um, and we, we, we think very highly of this. Uh, we a bit, um, uh, it, because there are no contractual overrides allowed for this exception, uh, we feel that it gives a lot more confidence to people who are running computational data analysis. Now, this may be people who are running, who are you know doing things at the high end gamut of um, training AI or machine learning, but it can also be people who are running sentiment analysis and stuff like that. So, because all that will be computational data analysis, and we hope that this kind of exception would help. Uh, businesses um, feel more confident about running it without feeling feeling that they might be infringing copyright. Okay, next. I'm running good on time. <laughs> um, so I'll very briefly kind of cover the enforcement and dispute resolution kind of system that we have in Singapore. I think Anushka has actually done quite a good job in um, summarizing some of the uh, relevant parts. So I'll just kind of give an overview and we can jump into questions later as well. So next slide, please. Um, this is the kind of framework that we, at least the policymakers, like to think of when we think about the enforcement and dispute resolution systems in Singapore. Um, we want to ensure that uh, there's high trust in our system, that um, the environment we have is business friendly, um, that there's a lot of choice in terms of the mechanisms, institutions and people in terms of what you want to use for your dispute resolution. We want to make sure that we have enough expertise in Singapore to run any of the types of dispute resolution you may need um, and we make sure that it's convenient for you. Um, so in terms of trust, I think Singapore is generally a trusted and fair and neutral country. Uh, no corruption and the courts are generally well seen upon as fair and neutral, um, not just within uh, Singapore, but I think um, kind of even if we have to have international cross-border disputes, I think we've always been seen as um, kind of neutral and fair and not kind of siding between, uh, siding with particular countries, for example. Um, in terms of being business friendly, we always try and review our laws to make sure that we meet uh, business needs. So we actually have uh, regular IP law reviews. Uh, some of the recent ones, I think uh, Anushka mentioned that we had an uh, IP dispute resolution uh, act that came in 2019. Um, I can talk a bit more about that later. Uh, sometime in, I think, 2017, we had an IP border enforcement uh, act, which also updated the uh, customs related um, uh, procedures. Um, 
I think 2016, we may have done a review of the Registered Designs Act. 20, in 2014 and in 2020, we had amendments to the uh, Geographical Indications Act. And then in 2021, uh, we did copyright. So I think what we're trying to do is to really make sure that all, all, of, all of our IP acts are business friendly um, and, you know, towards everyone. In terms of choice, um, we, I think I'll have another slide later on all the different uh, services that we have. I think we really try and make sure that um, uh, anyone coming into Singapore to do any sort of enforcement or dispute resolution has a full slate of choices of what they want to use. And similarly, in terms of expertise, um, I think Anushka mentioned just now that our high court has specialized IP judges um, in the Singapore, um, uh, International Commercial Court. We also have uh, specialized IP judges, I think in the Singapore International Arbitration Center. We also have uh, specialized IP arbit arbitrators. And given how specialized IP is, I think this is actually, um, is very useful for people who want to pursue anything in terms of IP, just to make sure that your judges uh, actually understand the topic at hand. Um, uh, when you come into the Singapore system, you have the possibility of hiring international expertise, international councils, international experts, some of the judges in the, um, the tribunals and the courts, which are not um, our domestic courts, uh, you have the ability to pull in uh, international judges as well. So that's something that uh, we hope to uh, provide for everyone. And in terms of convenience, um, before the the pandemic, <laughs> we were very proud to have um, um, set up our Maxwell Chambers, which is the world's first integrated dispute resolution complex. Uh, we were looking forward to people being able to visit Singapore and use those facilities. Um, now in pandemic times, um, I believe they have um, uh, kind of um, virtual hearings, uh, but I think it's something that you probably um, will enjoy more if you come uh, physically to Singapore. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, I think we have a very full slate of dispute resolution uh, services. In terms of litigation, I think uh, Anushka also mentioned, um, IPOS has a hearings and mediation department. They will hear any disputes relating to the registered IP, the IP that's registered with them because they are the registrar. Um, so for example, opposition for trademarks, invalidation, revocation. So those they will handle um, for... Um, Post-grant disputes, um, infringement, for example, um, our courts will handle most of it. So we have the state courts, the Supreme Court. Uh, just now, Anushka mentioned that we have an uh, upcoming, um, so we had a 2019 IP Dispute Resolution Act, which tried to, uh, which, which consolidated all of the non-registrar type of disputes. So basically infringement, um, uh, a declaration of non-infringement, those type of disputes will be um, consolidated in our uh, 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 high court, which is under the Supreme Court. And um, Anushka mentioned that I might be able to share a bit more. Uh, we had a recent press release, uh, which said that um, those provisions, as well as the new simplified uh, uh, simplified track for certain IP uh, claims, those will come into effect as of April 2022. I think that's the aim at least. I'm not sure whether there'll be anything that derails it, but that's the, the intention is to bring that all online in April. So from April onwards, there will be a track where you can opt for under the high court, which you would enjoy simplified uh, 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 processes for your claims. Uh, uh, for IP uh, matters. So uh, I think some of it may be uh, more judge-led type of situations. It may be um, more time management type of situations, but I think there'll be more details coming out in April. Um, we also have a Singapore International Commercial Court. So that is really for disputes that have no connection with Singapore at all. Um, it is not governed by Singapore law because uh, actually our soup court will be able to hear disputes that are um, for IP that's not registered in Singapore, but for example, the infringement was done in Singapore. So SICC will cover everything else where there's um, no link to Singapore at all, but if you want, you can come in um, and use our court system uh, and, and all our expertise to uh, litigate your, perhaps your ASEAN uh, related um, uh, uh, disputes. So in terms of arbitration, we also have a whole slew. So SIAC, WIPO has their uh, uh, AMC that's in here, that's the arbitration uh, mediation center. Uh, 
Uh, we also, I think, have the PCA, the Permanent Court of Arbitration that's housed in Singapore. Uh, and then for mediation, we also have a whole bunch. So uh, Singapore International Mediation Center, Singapore Mediation Center, and WIPO ANC. Uh, my last slide is next. <laughs> And finally, I think we really, um, over the last few years, really trying to push people into thinking harder about um, alternative dispute resolution methods um, in terms of mediation, especially because um, we do think that that's kind of a win-win situation. So if you ever come to Singapore or you're in Singapore already, you have an IP dispute with IPOS. So one of the registrable IP rights, which is on the IP register, is going to try to be on the IP register. We are trying to encourage you to choose mediation. And because of that, we have an enhanced mediation promotion scheme, uh, which subsidizes um, parties mediation costs. Uh, you can take um, any organization that runs uh, mediation um, and then uh, get some of the costs back from um, the enhanced mediation promo promotion scheme. So you can go to Singapore Mediation Center, Singapore International Mediation Center or AMC. Um, and uh, there are different buckets. So if there is a uh, just purely IPOSIS dispute, there's up to 10K per mediation case. If there are additional um, uh, foreign IP rights that are involved, uh, there's a 12K um, uh, Singapore dollars, uh, kind of like a subsidy. And that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Super, Lily, thank you so, so much, and Anushka as well. Some some extremely comprehensive information there. Um, some really, really, really good, uh, great, great presentations. Now, conscious that we've got about six minutes left. Um, so if there is anybody that does want to ask a question, please get it in now. Um, but I, I do want to sort of just bring Anushka back, if that's okay, and Lily, and perhaps I can just sort of ask a, a couple of questions that, that, that I might have for you. Um, Lily, Really interesting to hear about the Copyright Act of 2021. Are there any other upcoming legislative changes that we should look forward to in terms of IP enforcement? I would just say that um, for copyright, we actually have additional bits that are not uh, in effect yet. So most of it came in in uh, 21st of November last year. Okay. Uh, we have uh, sections in there that um, one relate to this um, consolidation of disputes in the high court. So right now, copyright disputes are kind of separated uh, based on uh, the, the level of damages, for example, between the high court and uh, the lower court. Um, with uh, the April uh, date, uh, all of that would move into the high court, uh, but will also be subject to this new simplified track for uh, processes uh, for claims. Um, and then, uh, for the rest of the IPX, that would really just be the IP Dispute Resolution Act. Um, uh, some of it actually has already been enforced, so we had a bit of it that um, clarified that uh, IP arbitration can be done in Singapore and it can have an impersonum kind of effect. Um, so that was already brought into effect in 2019, but the rest of it really is about consolidation into the High Court and, um, and the new simplified process track. I think other than that, nothing so far. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks so much, Lily. And Anushka, thanks for, thanks for coming back to us as well. Um, you mentioned in your presentation around, um, you su suggested that sending warning letters is a good way to deal with the infringement of IP. Um, don't businesses which are using someone else's IP just ignore warning letters? And why is there mm -hmm. such a good success rate with warning letter and negotiation approach? Can you just sort of, sort of embellish a bit more on that? Yes, that's that's because uh, they can't ignore you. But you know, the idea is to follow up. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. So the idea is to basically do follow up actions, a regular follow up actions on the warning letters, and ensure that they they know that there will be escalated measures of if there's no compliance, there will be litigation that can happen, and make them aware of you know the legal risks and the liabilities or the consequences of infringement. So uh, it is usually a very effective method uh, to basically allow the Infringer, especially you know when an infringer is a, leg, uh, a, a legitimate business, it's it's it, it, it's helpful to bring them on the table and discuss that uh, you know they should be uh, taken down and or if it's online or if it's, they should be uh, you know not doing infringing activities. So uh, another thing I would like to point out with regard to Singapore and and one letter is that there's there's uh, there's the unjustified sex issue. Uh, in 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 the, in the law, and so it's important that businesses, you know, they they uh, 
so when you're sending out warning letters it's important that you uh engage with lawyers and understand that you know what if you if you're warning, sending a warning to somebody it's not an unjustified threat and it's totally justified so that's that's another uh thing to flag when when warning letters are being sent out right no thank you thank you and conscious of time and i'm always got all gone sorry lily no, I was just trying to say that uh, I think in our IP laws, I'm, I'm sure that this happens in uh, British laws as well, but I think some of them talk about um, the infringer knowingly doing something or having uh, reasonably have known. So I think cease and desist letters is one of those clear situations where you've notified the guy and he continues to do it. I think it makes proving your case a lot easier um, if if that particular um, uh, panel, uh, offense or, or, or infringement talks about reasonable knowledge. Oh, super. I'm um, just conscious of time, but I'm, I'm always one to ask a silly question if I may, um, since there's nothing coming through from the audience. Um, and it's, we, we see lots of startups and lots of small businesses come through to Singapore. Um, you know, access to the ASEAN market is, is clearly very important for them. Um, and I assume they only tend to start paying attention to their IP after they've atten attained some sort of market traction or business stability. And um, I guess my silly question is, at what point should businesses be considering their IP? At what part of their journey should they really be thinking about this? So that's sort of a question to you both. Lily would like to take that. I would say, although I'm not sure it's practical, but I think you need to think about your IP from the very beginning. I mean, we, I know okay. we're talking about enforcement, um, but for certain IPs like patents or uh, uh, um, confidential information, if you don't think about how you're going to be protecting the IP or your strategies towards how you manage that IP, some of that will go down the drain because you may have done certain actions that will prevent you from protecting it in a certain way and you may regret it in the future. Um, but I completely understand that um, this is at the bottom of their priority list. And as, as the Ministry of Law and as Intellectual Property Office of Singapore, we speak to a lot of SMEs. We try very hard to educate a lot of um, uh, business owners out there. It's sometimes even the, the MSMEs, you know, the bigger ones, in fact. Um, and so it's really hard to get them to realize that um, this is something they need to pay attention to. Um, and, and what tends to happen is after you tell them this is something you need to be aware of they tend to panic after that like they freak out because they realize how much they don't know and then they they, they run the other way they they over they start thinking about everything in an overprotective manner but um i don't know the solution to this except for just educating people over and over again and the oh, manual yeah. the manual is one of the solutions you enforce the manual isn't it it's a guide and a help book for, for businesses, including SMEs, to understand what the process is and what the practicalities involved are and how important it is to reduce the UI. Oh, perfect. Really, really great advice. Thank you. Um, we've hit the, uh, the 5.30 mark now, and I've just noticed there are no questions that have come through. So that just leaves me to say to Anushka and to Lily, a huge thank you for your time and your content sharing. Um, this presentation will be available on our on-demand um, uh, part of the website as well, because I think there's so much content there as well. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly going to be um, having a rerun of this. So Anushka, Lily, thank you so, so much for your time today. And Desmond, also thank you to, to you as well for, for helping to open the session as well. It's great to, great to have you with us. And of course, thanks to Rouse for your continued support. Um, and those of you that join us in the audience, thank you very, very much indeed. And um, so just to Thank close you. things off, um, you will receive a feedback form from today's session. Please do fill that out. It helps me and the Chamber team to understand what you want more of, how we can deliver more value. Um, so please do, please do let us know what you think. Um, and just on the screen, you can see some of our fantastic events coming up in the next few months. Um, we have International Women's Day coming up next week. Um, we've got a, a sold out lunch already, but there's, we've got a really fantastic webinar um, coming up as well. So please do sign in for that. We've got a session on uh, planning for sustainable growth and the future of tourism in Singapore and um, sort of post COVID. So another great session there with the um, uh, with the Singapore Tourism Board as well. So, so please do join us for that. And um, that leads me to say a final thank you to our speakers, to Desmond, to Manushka, to Lily for your time and for you for joining us. And um,